gospel mm. pamphlets I think, I think ever sort of produced. Was sick of being sick. Awesome. One thing after another. It says, who is this Jesus her. is coming foretold? His message affects change. Died, an, a, an atheist I'm life transformed. This. Lord, so, liar, lunatic, a risen founder. It's not uncommon. The visible it's expression of the invisible yes. God, a living so, Lord. And then it goes through the steps um, to receive him. Like, and the well, prayer. That's enough and for me. the admonition, don't and depend and on your so, feelings, but so depend on your faith. Now that you've received him, uh, a lot of things um, taking place. <laughs> Suggestions just, for Christian you know, growth, one month where vacation and then some vacation scriptures that he fulfilled. And, and we got this out to everybody in the Harrisburg Mill. Right, right. Well, I am too. Long time. <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. Kim Broder. Jan staying home again. Oh, She's well, coming. All that extra work y'all is wearing y'all out. Eh? Did you take some notes, or are you gonna speak off the cuff? I took notes and haven't looked at them since I took them. <laughs> this is what you call years of knowledge just waiting to come out. Oh man! I hope it's not one of my confusing notes. I can't remember my name. <laughs> Never seen one of those before. You know, everybody has a a history, a story of their life. Maybe the story of a self-reliant person whose motto is, I'm going to do things my way. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. It may be the life story of somebody whose lust for power or who is greedy, who wants the world to open up to them. It may be the the life story of a person who's been caught up into a false religion where they try to appease the God that they pretend to worship who's really an idol. It may be the life story of an Islamic woman who's told that if you strap this bomb around you, and you blow yourself up killing the infidel, you're assured of going to heaven. Or it may be the life story of a person who is willing to give up his old self-willed, self-centered life for the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. To invite Jesus to come in and take over and lead and guide and direct the individual by the Holy Spirit. For those of us who have done that, we each have a testimony. A testimony consists primarily of three parts. What life was before coming to Christ, how the Holy Spirit revealed Christ to us and helped us to open up to Jesus so that we did receive him, and what life is now like with Jesus living within us and guiding and directing and using us by His Holy Spirit. So everyone has a life story. Mine began when the Holy Spirit blessed my mom and dad with conception and I was placed within my mother's womb and somewhere in the neighborhood of nine months later came bursting forth into this world feet first. <laughs> I'm sure in my own heart and mind that Dad took that as a sign. He had always wanted a preacher. And when I came on Sunday and kept him out of church, he said, you're going to be my preacher. Now, he didn't say that to me, but that's what I visualized that took place. We were greatly blessed, my brother Don, my sister Jean, my little brother Phil, and I, to be raised by a mother and a dad who truly loved Jesus. And they would gather us every evening, and dad would read a scripture passage, perhaps make a few remarks, and then we'd all get down on our knees, and dad would lead us in prayer. Not only that, any time the church doors were open, we were there. And in addition to that, two students came up from Columbia Bible College every Saturday and met in the fellowship hall of one of the local churches. 
and we went to that. And it was during one of those times that the Holy Spirit got through to me. The young student shared a message based on Isaiah, the first chapter. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as snow. And the Holy Spirit took that and helped me to realize what a glorious and holy and loving God who is out there and who had provided forgiveness and salvation for me in the person of His Son. And so, in faith, I invited Jesus to come to live within me. And that began an exciting journey. By the time I hit high school, the Lord did uh, an amazing thing. You don't hear of it today. I went out for the high school football team when the summer before my junior year. I would never had any football experience outside of backyard and a little touch in grammar school. And not only did he enable me to make the team, I was a starting in left in on offense, right in on defense. And by my senior year, the Lord enabled me to catch three touchdown passes and three passes for extra points. Now that was quite a feat for somebody who didn't have a football background. Well, it was that same summer when I noticed a major red and I asked her out for a date. I was hesitant to do so. Uh, she had dated several well-known students by that time. <laughs> but she said yes to this little nobody. And uh, the Lord drew her to me and me to her. And we started going steady, and we went steady during the high school years. She was a fine Christian. And I call her my first love, and you know who my best love is, that young lady over there. But she was my first love. And what time I wasn't going to our fellowship, I was going with her on Sunday evening. A Baptist always have three services, right? And uh, so, so I, I got a, a taste of a good Baptist doctrine. So, so we had a, a good relationship. Toward the end of high school, as we faced graduation, I realized that I was going to an all-male school at Davison and she was going to a co-ed school at Winston-Salem, Wake Forest. And it dawned on both of us that we could not maintain the relationship that we had had. Well, this grieved me. And I'm not exaggerating, for about the four years I was in Davison, I, I grieved to a degree over that young lady. It wasn't until I met Kathy that I got over that. I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Davison was a real challenge to me. Now in high school I'd done fairly well academically. I, I made the uh, Honor Society. I was elected, quote, most studious of the senior superlatives. And so I thought I had a pretty good background, but I found out at Davison I did not have a good background. <laughs> they did the freshman test, and my faculty advisor called me in and said, Son, you may consider taking a lesser load this year. I said, Well, sir, if, if you let me, I'd like to try. Well, he let me try, and the outcome of that was I worked myself to death. I studied, 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 studied. Uh, I could learn, but to retain it was something else. And biology, have any of y'all have taken biology? <laughs> that was a real bugaboo for me. I couldn't see through that microscope, for one thing. And what I did see was sort of blurry. And I couldn't draw what I saw. So in the labs, I, I couldn't see and I couldn't draw. And you don't pass labs that way. So I had a brilliant idea. Now, this wasn't from the Lord. This was a Charles Eaton idea. 
you are allowed four unexcused absences. And so I said, well, I'll just take those in lab. And so by the end of the fourth lab that I missed, the professor called me in, looked me in the eye and said, son, you're about to fail this course. I said, why? Because you missed all these labs. And they're mandatory for you to take the labs to pass the course. But the Lord softened his heart a little bit, and he did allow me to write four papers on the four subjects that I had missed. And I was glad to do that. And thereafter, I don't remember having a trouble with that microscope or anything else in those labs. <laughs> so that was an amazing thing. But at Davidson, I went out for the, the football team. The end of the first week, I had a fractured ankle with a walking cast. Then in about an, after school started, I, I was walking along the campus and a lung partially collapsed. And so some enterprising students, you know Davison Smarts, got a wheelbarrow and rolled me across the campus into the infirmary. Well, the Lord restored that lung, but I was still faced with an obstacle of climbing four sets of stairs to my room every day, maybe two or three times a day. And so the solution there was to go to Kannapolis back and forth until I was able to do that. <clears throat> so, in Davison, I was mentally challenged, I was emotionally challenged, I was physically challenged, I was spiritually challenged. But the Lord is gracious and He's good. And the Lord used that, I believe, to draw me even closer to Him and he reminded me that my hometown pastor was on radio. And so I would tune in every evening, Monday through Friday, and, and get, get that hometown message. I was also reminded of the wonderful Christian youth worker we had back home. First thing she did when she got to Kannapolis, to the, our church, was to go visit the various principals in order to attain the names of some of the more troubled students. And we would meet in her office and pray for them. And then at times we would actually go out and visit them. The Lord blessed those efforts and we had a thriving youth group. And the result of the Lord's ministry through her was that three pastors came out of that group, a Lutheran pastor, a Methodist pastor, and a Presbyterian pastor. Well, let's go back to Davison. And I really, really sought the Lord's help <laughs> to get through that school. And he graciously enabled me to do so now, I had determined a long time ago that the one thing that I could not possibly do was to become a preacher. Uh, I had tried giving a devotional at our youth group, and I had bombed out, in my humble opinion. I felt so badly about that that I went downstairs, didn't want to see anybody. And that convinced me, that one experience convinced me that I was no preacher material whatsoever. But you know, sometimes the Lord uses people like that. They can't do it in and of themselves. So if the Lord lays on your heart to do something, and you acknowledge, I can't do it, that's a good starting point. That's an excellent starting point. Because what we can't do, He can do in and through us. And so he led me, although I was hesitant, to go to a seminary. And that was great because I met Miss Kathleen there. Not at seminary, but at Agnes Scott. One of the students came up to me and said, I've got a date, but I don't have transportation. So if you'll provide transportation, I'll get a date for you through my date. And so she got a date for me and we drove to Agnes Scott, which is only about a mile, mile and a half from the seminary. We parked, 
we went into this waiting room where the girls checked out with their dates. And I looked and surveyed the situation and saw this vivacious, cute, lovely young lady. <laughs> and I thought to myself, somebody's going to be blessed tonight. And guess who that was? <laughs> that was me. And I've been blessed with 65 years knowing Kathy, 63 years as husband and his wife. Now that's older than most of you are. Can you imagine that? 63 years. Hmm. Now we've had some ups and downs, but she's still working to straighten me out and with the Lord's help, maybe she'll, maybe she'll get there. Pray for her. Pray for her. But we went out on that date and that led to many dates and finally I realized, well, you know, I think she's the one for me, and hopefully she realized the same thing. It may have taken her a little bit longer. <laughs> but we, we finally came to the conclusion that, yes, the Lord would have us to marry. Now, we may have jumped his timetable a little bit because we married before my senior year in seminary and her senior year at Agnes Scott. And so we wound up in a little garage apartment, and that was some apartment. I never forget that as long as I live. <laughs> you climbed up the steps, you went in to what was the, the dining room, the living room. Uh, there, there was a bathroom with a little tub that my knees were under my chin practically. <laughs> but the bed was the worst thing. She would get in bed and then when I got in she'd flip up. <laughs> Now you think that's exaggerating, <laughs> but I'm not. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> the old springs there. Yeah, so one well, of the first things we bought as husband and wife was a new uh, inner spring mattress. And, <laughs> but we had to take care of the old mattress and springs. We had to hang them up in that building downstairs. I mean, that landlady, she was strict. So we did that. And so uh, that, that year concluded and we received a call from a church in Thomasville, Georgia. Uh, I was to be the youth pastor at, at the larger church and also a chapel pastor at Dahl's Chapel where I preached every Sunday and then in the evenings we, we would go to the first church to work with youth. And the Lord blessed us in that we had the opportunity to work with three different pastors. The first one was a person who could really summer, sermonize. He could really bring forth a dynamic, stirring message. The second one was an interim, the epitome of a Christian gentleman. And he had not been remarried very long. His wife had died, her husband had died. And uh, her husband was the father of a professor that Kathy had at Scott. But he, he was something else. He, he, he was a real Christian gentleman. Then the third pastor was the one who got things done. Now, I needed more of those three to rub off on me than did, but I was exposed to that. And that was preparation, I believe, for being called to Harrisburg. Uh, we came to Harrisburg in September of 61. And you wouldn't... It'd be hard for you to imagine what all took place then. After a week, Kathy's father went to be with Jesus. So we went back to Dillard. Uh, the Lord helped me to prepare uh, the funeral, and the local pastor there and I conducted that service. Then when we got back, we were met by two sets of parents with their two children. And bless their hearts, their, their son and daughter had been intimate and had conceived. And their solution was for them to get married. Well, after counseling them and working with them, uh, I did marry them. Right after that, there was a death in the church. And after that, almost immediately, the man's 
brother committed suicide. And we had at least two or three suicides within that particular congregation. And I used to think there was a spirit of suicide in, in Harrisburg because we were not the only ones affected. But the Lord uh, used me graciously to, to minister to one person in particular after his father-in-law had taken his life. Uh, he lived, I think, that in that time in Richmond, Virginia, and he came down. And, and the Lord just got through me to him. And I think he renewed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he went back, he was aglow. And he got involved in uh, Voice of the Martyrs. <clears throat> and also Gideon. Didn't he become a Gideon cat? I think so. And we, we would have contact from time to time. But uh, he, he was a fruit uh, of the ministry that the Lord had uh, done through me. Well, Jesus has always been my first love. And my favorite hymn is, I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. And this came out in the messages that I brought back in, in the church. So much so that uh, I was confronted one time and said, you preach as if some of us are not saved. I said, well, <laughs> I don't know that everybody is saved in this congregation. But that, that offended uh, this particular group. And they got worked up in, in right much of a lather about it. And they were also threatened by the newcomers who had started coming in. And they felt like this is our church and these newcomers are coming in to take over. Whereas they should have reached out in love and said, brother, sister, we're together in the worship and praise and adoration and ministry and service of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they didn't do that. And so they pushed this thing to a limit and took it to the presbytery. What's a presbytery? Well, in that denomination set up, a presbytery consists of the churches in a, a, a various area. The pastors and the churches and the, the elders. And about four times a year, the pastor and an elder would go to presbytery. Well, presbytery had a, a committee or commission on the minister and his work. And that was their work to oversee the pastors in their particular presbytery. So they were invited in. And after, uh, a, I started to call it an investigation, <laughs> maybe that's what it was, <laughs> but after talking to, to some of the people who had the complaints, uh, they decided that I needed to take a leave of absence. Now this turned out great, for me at least. I had three study opportunities that they laid out before me. One was to go to a... Uh, conflict resolution conference and which I realized more and more that there are politics in church. That's about the best thing I got out of it, I think. But the other two opportunities were great. One was to go to uh, St. Andrews College at St. Andrews to their vocational guidance center and there you engage in a variety of tests to see what you're actually qualified or suited to do. In other words, the various gifts that the Lord may have given you and where you ought to land, what you ought to do. And after going through that, my number one qualification was to be a priest. The second thing I was qualified for was to be a pastor. So that sort of confirmed to me that, that I was possibly where the Lord or doing what the Lord wanted me to do to be a pastor. But another wonderful opportunity that the Lord presented me during this time was to go to Baptist Hospital in Winston-Salem uh, to, to study uh, to be a chaplain. And you know a chaplain uh, visits the sick and the afflicted and the dying and, and the Lord uh, better equip me to minister to people through that experience. 
Well, finally the time came when I came back to a local church and preached my first sermon, and some of these precious people came up to me and said, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> There's no hope for you. <laughs> they didn't say that, but you haven't changed a bit. So then I really, really got serious seeking what the Lord had in this situation for me. And so I withdrew to a secluded home that uh, somebody graciously provided and fasted and prayed for two or three days and really sought what the Lord wanted me to do. And what he wanted me to do was a bombshell. He wanted me to resign as pastor from that church. He wanted me to give up my ordination as a pastor. He wanted me to get out of a denomination in which I grew up. And so I said, yes, Lord. It took me a year to get out of the, the denomination. Now, the Lord provided during that time, he provided some help from the church which I left. And I, I thank the Lord for that and thank them for that. Uh, I also had several preaching opportunities. But we also had the opportunity to visit various churches in the area and to see what was going on. A group was left in the old church that had to make a major decision. We don't feel like we can stay here. We don't believe that the Lord's will was actually carried out. But at that time in Harrisburg, the, uh, the two of the major churches were in disarray. One had a pastor preaching reincarnation. Another one of the church had a pastor who, who was having an affair. So they didn't see their way clear to go to either one of those congregations. And so they came together and sought the Lord's will, and he laid on their heart to form another congregation, which is the Covenant Church of Harrisburg. This was to be a Jesus-centered and focused congregation who really believed and taught and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Word of God as the Word of God. They wanted to be a congregation that was more concerned about God's Word than they were what the denomination, whatever it may be, would want. And so the Lord led them to get up a constitution which set forth the major beliefs of the church, this congregation, and also the bylaws by which the church was to be governed. The constitution, as well as I can remember, has not been changed whatsoever. The bylaws have been altered from time to time, and probably rightfully so. So uh, a new congregation came into being. They started meeting at the Lions Club. Again, I was in the process of getting out of the denomination. I was trying to do things the right way. So I, I did not take part in the formation of this congregation other than prayer. I'm giving the credit or the discredit, but I didn't form this congregation. That steering committee, led by the Holy Spirit, was instrumental in this congregation coming into being. Now, by the time I did go through all the hoops and left the denomination and left my ordination, this church had already been going. I think it was their first Sunday, the church's first Sunday was November 14th or 15th, 1976. And they began meeting in the Lions Club and Dr. J. Allen Blair, Glad Tidings Radio, any of you go back that far? No? And an associate of his, Raph Mucker, filled in the pulpit a good bit. Sunday school classes met in various houses, and they came to, together to worship at the Lions Club. Well, the church felt led to call me to become pastor in February of 1977. 
And it wasn't long before uh, two of Mr. Keyen's store buildings became available. And so we had some gifted people. We really did. We had some people who knew how to do things, and they went in and remodeled, had a choir loft, had a pulpit area. Somebody actually built the pulpit. We had a baptismal fount, which doubled as a communion table. Uh, one of the people worked at a, a chemical factory, and he came across this vat that was full of holes, hundreds of holes, and I'm not stretching it. And he fastidiously sealed up those holes. They made a top for it so that it could be a communion table as well. When a person was to be baptized, they took off the lid, filled it with water, tried to heat it a little bit. Sometimes that wasn't very successful. <laughs> and if you were fortunate, you didn't get too wet when somebody went down in the water and came up out of the water. And the Lord blessed those times. Uh, we eventually were blessed with being able to purchase this land where this, these buildings uh, are, are located. And also we were led to have a, a fundraiser selling bonds. You should give and give and give until you have the money and you, you don't go into debt. But uh, rightly or wrongly, that's, that's the way we did it. And I never will forget the, the, the night the last bond was sold. Uh, some of you may remember Bill Morgan when he grabbed Doug Howell. I know you remember Doug. And Doug's pretty big. And Bill's hefty. And he just picked him up and twirled him around. So, so elated that that last bond had sold. Well, the best thing about those bonds was it was a high rate of interest. That's not the best thing. The best thing was that we were able to pay those bonds up before they reached maturity, complete maturity. So thousands of dollars were saved in, in that regard. Well, we had the land, we bought this land, and we engaged a contractor to, to build the building across the way. And we met. And the Lord began to really pour out his blessings. And I don't know exactly when it was after that that we really faced a major crisis in the congregation. That's when Francis' son, uh, Keith's son, Mac, uh, dove into a pond of water and fractured his neck. And he came floating up, face down, and who was with him, Francis? Who? Uh, it was Bradford, uh, Michael Bradford. Michael Bradford's the one that dragged him out. And uh, who else came? But anyhow, they, they rescued him and then brought him to safety, and an ambulance was called. I'm sure he was taken to uh, Charlotte Memorial. Charlotte Memorial that time. They keep changing names. And Francis Blesser came to me and said, Charles. Mac is one of the best sons a person could possibly have. But I'm not certain about his relationship with Jesus. Will you go in and share with him? And I said, sure, Francis. So I went in, and they had him incubated, but he could still listen and nod his head. And I said, Mac, you're a great guy. But we want to know if you are assured of your relationship with Jesus. And he wasn't quite sure. I said, would you like to make sure? And he said, yes, I would. And so I had the, the privilege of leading him to Jesus Christ or making sure of his relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Lord began to do some remarkable things there. We initially thought that there was a real possibility, maybe even a likelihood, that he would be on a ventilator the rest of his life. Well, the Lord opened the door for him to go to Shepherd's Hospital in Atlanta. And there they got him off the ventilator and into a, a motorized chair, which eventually he was able to operate on his own. 
And the Lord has used Mac to reach so many different people that it's amazing. Uh, to me, he's, he's in a way sort of the epitome of what Covenant Church is all about. And his testimony has gone year and far. Now, we might be thinking, well, he didn't raise him up where he could walk on his own legs. No, but as Mac himself puts it, and I'm quoting him almost verbatim, I wouldn't choose to be in this wheelchair. But I know I'm better off in the wheelchair knowing Jesus than out of the wheelchair not knowing Jesus. That's right, man. And the Lord used that testimony, I'm sure, to reach many people for himself. And Mac is a living example of that. And if you and I had to go through what Mac does one day, we would be even more amazed and dumbfounded at his attitude and the way the Lord continues to reach out through him to people, even people who don't know him initially. Uh, I only know of one or two people that don't appreciate Mac, and that's their problem. It's not <laughs> Mac's problem. He was in two months in Charlotte before he went to Atlanta. He was there every single day. Every single day. And I worked at the hospital, and uh, they said, Francis, do you realize your preacher comes every day? And they, preachers don't do that. They don't visit anymore. I said, they don't. He does. <laughs> <laughs> he always did. He was always there for everybody. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. What I'm going to do. Oh, no. Lively in color. So the Lord did a great work and is still doing a great work uh, in and through Mac. Well, We were introduced to what some people call the, the full gospel. And this took place even when I was in the former church. In fact, one of the ladies there called me and said, what do you think about speaking in a heavenly language? I said, well, I know enough to know that it's biblical. I know it's in the Bible. And as I got to looking into it, I found out where Paul had written, I wish you all spoke with tongues or heavenly languages, but even more that you prophesied. So not only did Paul speak in heavenly languages, he said, I wish that all of you did, but even more that you prophesy, that you speak forth the word of God in, in plain English or whatever language you're using. Now, I know there's a real controversy about the gifts of the Spirit. The main theme is that they were used to get the church started in the early days, but after the completion of the New Testament, and after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, uh, and, and the church got started by signs and wonders and miracles as the uh, Paul and the other apostles proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ and the Word of God, that that concluded the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit, I think, is not to be limited. We all agree about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We all agree that's a good thing. That's the, that's the character of Jesus being produced within us by the Holy Spirit. But some of us and a lot of people get a hang up about the gifts of the Spirit. Basically, the power to know through knowledge, wisdom, and discernment, to speak through prophecy and tongues and interpretation, and to do through faith, miracles, and healings. Now, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he didn't say that those gifts went out. And when he instructed the Apostle Paul to write what he wrote, uh, they were active in the early church. They were practice. And so I get real concerned about people who immediately just cut you off if you believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. 
And I don't want to cut anybody off tonight. But beloved, I've experienced enough of the gifts of the Spirit to know that they are real. They are real. And that they should be in operation today. In these last days in which we're living, in which the devil is gaining more and more of foothold and more and more Christians are being killed and slaughtered. We need all the help that the Holy Spirit can give. And He's willing to give it. But there's some people who cut him off saying, no, I don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit anymore, especially the, the gift of heavenly language. And that's sad. That, that, that's really tragic. If we do disagree about it, we don't have to cut each other off saying, well, I'm not going to have anything else to do with you because you believe one way and I, I believe another way. No, we're to thank the Lord for each other and let the Lord lead and guide us in what He's given to us. But again, I've experienced enough of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to know that they are for today, as well as the beginning of the church. And I thank the Lord. Now, any gift can be treated differently. If it's a gift from God, it's a good gift. But even a gift from God, the greatest gift of all, salvation, can be rejected. Uh, a gift from God can be received but neglected. A gift from God can be received and abused and misused to exalt oneself rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. But a gift from God rightly under the control of the Holy Spirit can be a tremendous blessing in reaching people with the gospel and the Word of God. You, you take throughout the world. Yes, there, there are people preaching the simple gospel and people are being saved and people are being built up in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are other people who believe in the gifts of the Spirit and signs and wonders are taking place. They're undeniable for those who have minds that are open and, 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 and wills to say, yeah, Lord, thank you. And people, multitudes of people are being reached because of the gifts of the Spirit. Well, I'm not going to major on that. But the time came here in Covenant when I believe the Lord was telling me it's time to step aside. Now, I had people in the church said, you're making a mistake, you're making a mistake, you're, you're going to retire too soon. But I really believe that's what the Lord wanted me to do. And part of that was, I thought we had hit a plateau. And I said, Lord, if you want me to stay on as pastor of this congregation, give me a sign. Give me a sign of awakening. Give me a sign of a... Uh, a new enthusiasm, give me a sign of a new outreach for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now prior to this time, the church had really reached out to this community. One thing we did was to have a mailing uh, of this pamphlet, Who is this Jesus? It tells about his coming. It tells about how his message affects change. It tells about an atheist life being transformed. It says, well, Jesus is either a Lord, liar, or lunatic. Not even a good man if he's a lunatic. Uh, Jesus is the risen founder. Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God. Jesus is the living Lord. And inside were steps to receive Jesus and the prayer to make and don't depend on feelings but depend on what the word of the Lord says. And now that you've entered in a personal relationship with Jesus, these various things and suggestions for Christian growth and then uh, some prophecies that he had fulfilled. And then, dear friends, and I'm going to read this to you. Jesus is alive. This was sent during an Easter period of time. We're so excited at Covenant Church and the risen living Lord Jesus that we want to share with you. We trust you're experiencing the fullness of life and joy that comes from Jesus, who arose from the grave that first Easter morning. 
If you would like someone to share more with you about Jesus, call 455-2243, which is the church number. Also, if you're looking for a church home, we invite you to worship with and prayerfully consider covenant. Our building is located on the corner of Hickory Ridge and Stallings Road. We would also like to extend to you a special invitation to be blessed by the Easter cantata the last week, Saturday and Sunday, March 22, 23, at 7 o'clock. A Good Friday communion service, March 28, 730. An early Easter service at 7 a.m. An Easter morning service, March the 30th at 1045. And then there was a listening of the weekly services and activity on Sunday and Wednesday and then monthly of the women of the church. And also we put a plug in for the community Easter service, which was a celebration of praise service at Providence, a Sunday, April the 8th at 530. So we mail this to everybody on the Harrisburg mail right, route. And there were times, especially during uh, Christmas and Easter, we would get out letters and, and mail them to the community at large and informing them of the service that, was, that we had. And, and, and the Lord used that outreach into the community, bringing people in. We also had people active in the town government. At one time, the mayor was from this congregation. Then later on, he became a town manager. We had two or three town council members from this congregation. So the Lord was using this, this congregation to really reach out to the community in a spiritual way, but also as far as city government was concerned, having an input on behalf of Christ. And at the same time, this, this congregation encouraged the pastors to meet. And our ladies, bless them, every Christmas prepared a delicious Christmas meal for the pastors. And they did this graciously and they did this lovingly. So, so we, we, we promoted the, the oneness that we all have in Jesus Christ as Christians. So these are some of the things that, that were going on. But the time came again when I really believed that we'd hit a plateau and that the Lord uh, maybe had somebody else in mind for this body of believers. And so I, I stepped aside and then the church was very gracious in giving us a going away banquet and sort of a testimonial. And we'll always appreciate that. But I had never wanted anything named after me except my son. <laughs> I didn't want my name on a Sunday school class. I didn't want my name on a building. And so I was shocked <laughs> when I saw Charles M. Eford, Family Life Center. And I asked the session to please take that down. <laughs> and they refused to do so. I said, well, can you add the scripture verse, uh, Philippians 1.21, to live as Christ and to die as gain. But I want to make another appeal in this testimony to this session, and maybe y'all can put some heat on them, to take my name down off there and put Jesus Family Life Center. Now, if you really want to make me joyous, do that. Please do that. Jesus Family Life Center, leaving the verse intact to live as Christ, to die as gain. See, this church is not about me. It's not about any pastor we've ever had. And it's not about even our beloved Pastor Gene. And I give him my 100% support. But it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And my prayer and hope is that I'll continue to be a Jesus-centered and focused person because it's only in Jesus that God becomes our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit indwells us. I can't have, you can't have, this church cannot have God as our Heavenly Father and be dwelt by the Holy Spirit without Jesus. So Jesus is to be the center, He's to be the focus. And I pray this will always be true of this congregation. We have a, a capstone, headstone, Jesus our cornerstone with two passages from the Word of God which declare that. And on the back of that stone are written the names of the youth who paid for that stone. And it was placed. 
and, and this is my prayer, that we'll always be a Jesus-centered, Jesus-focused congregation to the glory of God through the working of the Holy Spirit. Now, what took place after I did retire? Well, I didn't just kick up my feet and watch the world go by. For 20-some years, I participated in the Salvation Army. The last 20 was to head up the Salvation Army Kettle. What does that entail? Getting in touch with the area pastors, seeing if their church would take a day doing the kettle. And most of you here probably have done that. And you know what a blessing it can be. Well, I'm, I'm theorizing because I don't have the figures before me, but anywhere from five to $7,000 was raised about each of those 20 years. And that's a good, tidy sum of money. And that was to use by the Salvation Army in their ongoing ministry of proclaiming Jesus Christ and ministering to people in need. Seems like I've done something else, Kathy. <laughs> But I'm not exactly sure what that is now. But, uh, you love the Gideons. Do what? Gideons. Gideon. Well, I, I've, I've helped promote the Gideons. My, my dad and two other people established the first Gideon camp in Cabarrus County, and now there are three. And uh, my brother was president of Gideons International at one time. And so I've always been interested in the Gideons and the sort of promoted Gideons here. But I, a pastor can't be a Gideon. If I were not a pastor, I would probably have been a Gideon. But the Lord has encouraged me to, to visit people during the time of retirement, although I've greatly slowed down the last year or two. And uh, he's me to help beautify, keep the church property in order and Gene kept after me give it up give it up so I took his advice <laughs> I've given it up it's up to y'all uh, and you, you, you might I haven't mentioned my, my children we were blessed with four precious children which the Lord has used two of them in the teaching profession one of them is a paramedic and one uh, to help combat the horrific drug traffic in America, working for the government. He was working for the government doing that out of the country a good bit of the time. Uh, I wouldn't take anything for any of my children. And you may wonder, well, how are you handling two of them going to heaven ahead of you? That's a good question. I don't understand it. I really don't. I was convinced that when Kathy and I were uh, in Vermont, Rutland ministering to Joy, and especially after pastors came in and talked with her and anointed her and prayed with her, Lord, I know you're going to raise her up. I know she's critical. I know she's at the point of death. But Lord, I know nothing's impossible with you. Well, after all those prayers, he gave her the ultimate healing. And who am I to distrust the Lord? I'm not, the Lord's help and grace, I'm not about to distrust the Lord. Now, I may not show it all the time, and maybe sometimes I do, but uh, I'm, I'm not aware and conscious of it. And then comes Mark. And he was one of Mary's tennis buddies. And Kim left no stone unturned. She called people, uh, <laughs> and hundreds of people were praying for Mark. And the Lord heard all those prayers, but in His wisdom, He called him home. He called him home. But that's a sign to me that the Lord heard those prayers and He gave him the ultimate healing. Collected or written by me. In other words, I didn't write all of this, but I give credit where credit's due. And then there was a second set. You go through the first set and you turn it over and you start the second set 
Well, if you're interested in having one of these, uh, if you'll sign this paper here, sermon booklet, I'll see that you get. Some of you may have this. I know at one time we gave them out. Now those were, I consider, rough copies. There were a lot of typographical errors in those, and I went through a bunch of them trying to correct it. But these are better, type-wise. So if, if you'd like a better copy of what you may already have, if you'll sign that, that. And the Lord willing, I pray that he'll fill in and cause you to hear what he wanted you to hear, even though I may not have said it, that he will give you his interpretation and not so much your interpretation of what's been shared and that he'll be honored and magnified and glorified, that he'll draw us all closer to him and one another. And my prayer for myself and my family as well as for each one of you and for this congregation is that we will increasingly let Jesus live his resurrection life within us and increasingly let him continue his ministry of service and witness and the making of disciples through us to the glory of the Father. So let's pray. Lord, just take anything that was not of you and, and just rid it from our minds. But what was of you, Lord, we pray that you will implant it in our minds and in our hearts. And help us always to, to put you first and to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, which is a summary of the Christian life. So, Lord, we, we take this opportunity to commit ourselves to you. And, Lord, if there has been misunderstanding, we pray that uh, whoever wants to will come and we'll, we'll talk some more. But, Lord, rule and overrule and accomplish what you have in mind for this sharing this evening, and we'll give you the credit. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. You can talk. I just want to get your faces. <laughs> okay, if you should want a joy booklet or a sermon booklet, please sign this. You won't hurt my feelings if you don't. Charles did a great job, brother. This one was like yeah. in the table rock right. to make it to make noise. I was like, oh man. Thank you for yet another opportunity to bear witness to Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, my God, my healer my deliverer, my baptizer, and my friend. He truly is awesome. In the words of the hymn, To God be the glory, great things He has done, so loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. God is simply awesome. We shared uh, how he brought Kathy and me together. But to add to that, and to make it even better, is that she was a substitute. The girl that I was supposed to date 
the Lord took care of and gave her something else to do and raised up Kathy to take her place. So the girl that I finally met looking across the way was none other than my bride, my love. And I thank the Lord for her and for the children uh, with which the Lord has blessed us and their spouses and the grandchildren. We even have a great-grandchild on the way that will be born uh, sometime in March. If it's March the 4th, it'll be my birthday, but they <laughs> think about later on in March. But truly, uh, we are blessed. We continue to be blessed uh, all of our 63 years of marriage. I shared that the only thing good in me is really Jesus. And, and that's not to play humble, it is to be humble because it's the truth. And anything bad in me is the remnants of the old nature that acts up from time to time. I shared how Jesus led me to give up my ordination in a denominational church but tonight, I want to share with you that he led me to an independent church to be reordained. That made me legal as a pastor, and I could uh, marry people without going against the law. I also wanted to talk about being filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. We mentioned the gifts of the Spirit that I'm convinced that they are for today in these troubled times in which we live, immediately preceding Jesus' return to this earth, it takes the Holy Spirit to convict anybody of God's holiness and righteousness, of man's sinfulness, and of the judgment that's sure to come. But the great solution that God the Father has given to me and each one of us in Jesus Christ. Once we open up our heart and our life to Jesus. He comes to indwell us by the Holy Spirit. And we have all the Holy Spirit there is to have. We have all the Holy Spirit there is to have. But the question is, when I received Jesus, did I give him all of me? Does he have all of me? Now what is it to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, if you're filled with anything, you're under its influence or control. An, alcohol is un an alcoholic is under the influence and control of alcohol. A person, uh, a dope addict, is controlled by the quest for more and more dope. A person whose main goal in life is fame or fortune or power that's what he or she is under the influence of. And the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit is under the influence and guidance of the Holy Spirit. When Martin went to be with Jesus, there was a great outpouring of God's love through you and through many others but later on, the, the thought occurred to me, what about the people with whom I have ministered and to whom I have ministered? I, I don't remember uh, them reaching out. Then the Lord began to deal with me. I said anything bad with me. But the Lord began to deal with me about that. And he said, well, have you always reached out in meaningful ways to grieving people? Who are you to set up standards for a way a person should reach out to somebody in grief? And so he, he really got on my case. And I thought, you know, Lord, you're right. I, I don't know their circumstances. I don't know why they didn't apparently reach out. Uh, they may have things going on in their life that are far more grievous to them than, than what I'm facing now. 
He reminded me of something that he tried to teach me a long time ago. Don't give offense unless it's the offense of the gospel, and the gospel does offend some people. But don't take offense. Don't wear your feelings on your sleeves. Don't notice what you may think are slights. Just let that run off. But for some reason or the other, I sort of fixated on this time. And so we want to be careful how we respond to people, whether they respond to us or not. You know, if, if we concentrate on what we expect people to do or not do, that can lead to hurt. And then hurt can lead to unforgiveness. And unforgiveness is one of the greatest sins that any of us face. Because that's not of God. Forgiveness is of God. Unforgiveness is of the enemy. And so when I get so wrapped up in, in what I think people ought to do that I begin to hold it against them, that's, that's unforgiveness. And Jesus is the great example of a forgiver. On the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Who was he forgiving? Well, the Sanhedrin, who plotted his death. The mob who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. The Roman soldiers who whipped him mercilessly, nailed him to the cross. But also, he was forgiving you and me because it was for our sake that he died. He took my sins upon himself and thank the Lord he also took your sins upon himself and died in our place as a sacrifice for our sins so that we might truly be forgiven and have a right and good relationship with God the Father. And he teaches us in his word to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgives you. Just as God in Christ forgives you. Jesus teaches us to pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. In other words, when I pray that prayer, I'm praying to the Lord, Lord, don't you forgive me unless I become a channel of that forgiveness to other people. And that's a serious prayer to make. Have I ever prayed in an unforgiving manner? Have I ever prayed, the Lord forgive me when I haven't been able to forgive somebody else or I haven't chosen to forgive somebody else? I was sharing with, with somebody recently and he said, you know, if you had had my childhood, you wouldn't be so forgiving. And I said, yes, by the grace of God, I would. Because he's helped me to realize I don't have to want to forgive. I don't even have to feel like forgiving. But in obedience to him and with his help, I choose to forgive. And ask him to take care of the, the hurts or the problems as a result of that to ask him for the help that's needed. Mm -hmm. but, but unforgiveness is, is so, so important. When we first came to Harrisburg, I soon became acquainted with uh, some of the nursing homes around. And the Lord opened the doors of ministry for that. In fact, before COVID hit, I was still going out to what was then called Carillon to share Jesus Christ and to share how he wanted to bless and take care of those dear people there. And those were some precious people. And I look forward to the time when the doors will once again open and pastors can go into those nursing homes. So he gave me a nursing home ministry he also gave me a prison ministry. Again, right after coming to Harrisburg, 
I became aware of the boys at Jackson Training School, or Stonewall Jackson School for Boys. And at that time, they had cottages. And in each cottage, they had house parents. And those house parents served as real parents to those boys, probably giving them a better home situation than some of them had ever known before. Uh, caring for them, reaching out to them, showing them their concern, but also a tough love when they needed discipline. Well, it's hard to imagine uh, today, but at one time, Jackson School had a Christian Emphasis Month. And various pastors came into the cottages and shared Jesus Christ with them. And at the conclusion of that, they had an overall meeting of, of all the boys and of the house parents and of the attendants and, and the pastors who had, who had uh, ministered. Later on, they did away with the cottage concept and began what I would call a pod concept. They grouped boys and they had individuals to oversee those boys, but they didn't serve as foster parents. We had one man in covenant who was really led of the Lord to, to minister out there and through his influence we had about three more to join them. So at one time we had about five people ministering at Jackson Training School. But the Lord led at least two of these individuals to extend, extend their ministry to prisoners. And at one time, they had access to every jail and every prison in Mecklenburg County. They were considered as chaplains. And I had the privilege of joining them on occasion to uh, minister to some of those prisoners. Also went with them to Virginia to minister there to a penitentiary. And we also went to a nursing home and I became acquainted with Granny Dumping. Granny Dumping. Virginia had a law in those days, and I don't know if it's still in effect, that if you had a loved one or even a child who was handicapped and you felt like you could no longer provide for that child or take care of the child or provide the financial resources for him to go to a center, that you could take that person to that center and leave them there and they were op legally obligated to take care of that person. Now that was a good thing for people who simply couldn't afford it or were beyond their abilities to care for their loved ones. But I'm sure it proved a temptation to a number of people who just brought people there and left them. Well, that's not what the Lord has in mind. He wants us to minister to people in nursing homes as well as to people in prison. And I'm very thankful that, that he's led me to do both. The Lord also led me into what I call a baby ministry. Saving the lives of the unborn. He impressed upon that upon me so forcefully that I would actually go out with others and have pickets at abortion centers. And we would carry signs, Jesus loves babies, stop the killing. And of course, you could only get so close to one of those clinics, but you could march up and down the, the sidewalk with, with the signs. And I was led to do that in both Charlotte, several places, and also in Concord. And one time in Charlotte, some of us actually entered an abortion clinic and sat down in the hallway to stop the procedures that were going on. Well, that lasted until the police got there and carried us out. <laughs> Literally carried us out. Now, you may be thinking, you broke a law. And yes, I confess, I broke a law. But it was an unjust law. What's an unjust law? 
And a just law is a law made by man that contradicts the laws of God. And this is taking place all over the world today. In North Korea, you're not allowed to have a Bible even. And if you bear witness, you're going to wind up locked up. So there are unjust laws that there are times when the Lord moves upon us to break. The day may come when the Bible is declared hate literature. And there are, also, there are even people today who say it's hate literature. But if we were ever told we could not teach or preach or share the gospel as found in the Word of God, we would have to break those laws and suffer the consequences. And again, that's what multitudes of people are doing in our day. You know, it may surprise some of us, but even the state of North Carolina has given us the opportunity to bear witness to the Lord. If you were to go to the tag agency, you would discover that there are three different statements you could have above your tag. First in freedom, first in flight, flying, or in God we trust. In God we trust. So I would encourage you the next time you get a tag to get one that says in God we trust. Now, some people think this is tacky, but I, I trust that I've heard from the Lord. On my two cars, I have additional signs. One says Jesus. That's the one I drive the most, the Altima. And the other one that says Jesus with a heart stands for loves you. And my prayer is that whether there are people in front of me looking in the rearview mirror, that they'll see those signs, or if they're behind me, they'll see on the tag. And that the Lord will use that as a witness. Well, he wants us to witness. He wants me to witness. And Mark has, has blessed us in, in showing us various ways that, that we can witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's to be our main goal in life. To exalt Christ. To share with people. John 3.16. To pray for people to encourage people, to let Jesus reach out through us, not only to one another, but to the peoples of this world, with prayers and giving and going. And Gene's led several mission trips, or been involved in several mission trips, and I suspect that sooner or later, uh, this church will be invited to, to join in that. The Lord also uh, used me in another way that's when our last pastor lived. I felt the strong impression to volunteer to be the moderator of the session and also of the pulpit search committee. And the session agreed to that. And I had a blessed time in working with those men and uh, sharing with them and them sharing with me. Uh, we would begin each session meeting, just general talking and then that led into uh, a little scripture and a little sharing, and then we went around the room praying, and those were meaningful times, and, and I, I believe the Lord uh, used us and, and directed us. One thing he did was to uh, encourage us to adjust some of the bylaws to make them better. The pulpit committee was also special. And one or two of you were on that committee. We, as I remember, got in touch with some of the seminaries in, in the Charlotte area and really didn't get much help from them. But we began to hear about people who were available to preach. And so we would invite them in. And finally, after prayer and discussion and seeking the Lord's will, we, we came up with, with two people that we really believe were possibilities that the Lord had for us. And then the Lord made it clear, and I won't go into details, 
but he made it clear that his choice was our present pastor and how blessed we are that that was true and that Gene and Carla have been with us now for what, two years? Four. Oh, four. <laughs> well, you know, when you have any good time, time seems short. But Jesus didn't call them here, and I'm going to preach some, like I haven't been preaching. He didn't call them here to do our work of ministry. He called them here to train us to do the work of ministry that the Lord has called us to do as a congregation. Each individual participating because each individual is a part of the body of Jesus in this place. And he's given to each one of us certain gifts and talents. And we're to prayerfully make ourselves available and ask, Lord, what is it, what is it you want to do through me to build this body up? and to have a greater outreach in our community. And when we do that, the Lord will use us to strengthen this body of believers so that we will have a greater, stronger outreach into our community and county and state and nation and world. That's what we're called to do. And he's given us a pastor and his wife to help us do that. And so I want to encourage each one of us to pray even more earnestly for them, to be more actively involved as led by the Holy Spirit, so that we can increasingly be that church that the Lord calls us to be. What kind of church? His worshiping, nurturing, loving, serving, witnessing, giving and discipleship making congregation of believers to be the church that he's called us to be the church that he will enable us to be so I'm not going to take that whole hour <laughs> but I do trust that we will all join together in prayer. Oh Lord our God, you are truly awesome. You are fantastic. Lord, we pray that more and more we'll experience you as the God that you are. That we'll know your love and your holiness that will experience you and be your channels not only to one another but to our families to our neighbors to the people among whom we work through our prayers and giving and going to a world that is desperate to know you Jesus because you are the way, the truth, and the life to the Father. There is no other way. And Lord, we thank you that there were people through whom you reached out to and introduced us to you. And we came to know you. Now there are people out there, Lord, that you want to reach through us. So Lord, enable me, enable each one of us to be more available to you. So that when you call us home or come after us, we'll be ready. And we acknowledge our complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit to do that, Lord. We know that we can quench the Holy Spirit by not being open to the gifts of the Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit by the unforgiveness. We can disobey the Holy Spirit as He reveals to us more and more what He wants to do in and through us. So Lord, help us always to be Spirit-filled 
Lord, we know we can be spirit-filled a part of the time and not spirit-filled another part of the time, depending upon whether we are obedient to you and letting your spirit guide us and direct us and empower us. And that's our prayer. It's in your name we pray, Jesus, and that to the glory of the Father. Amen. Yes, I would, but I do want to share one other thing. Don't tell you it's going to take this whole hour. You want, you, want to save it? you want to save it for next Wednesday? No, no, I don't want to save it. <laughs> Talking about babies. The general theme is among people who believe in abortion. It's not a real baby. It's a piece of tissue. And the mother thinks I have the right to do with my body what I want to do with it. But that's not God's will. God reveals to us in a very clear and wonderful way through His own Son that there's life at conception, that the fetus is a person with potential, not a person who can become a, a person. The fetus is a human being. And we see this in the story of Luke concerning the Holy Spirit's conception of Jesus within the womb of Mary. After this took place and the Holy Spirit came upon her, he directed her to go visit her cousin Elizabeth. Luke 1, 36. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Sixth month of John the Baptist within her womb. But with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the, hand, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. The angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days, the days in which she had conceived, and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord, Jesus as a fetus, was called the mother of my Lord, should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. That's John the Baptist. Blessed is she, that's Mary, who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now, for the Christian, that, that should really settle it in our own hearts and minds. Jesus had just been conceived a short period before Mary went to visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth called Mary the mother of my Lord, the fetus Jesus as her <coughs> Lord. Now, that, that really speaks to me. That really grabs me as I trust it's grabbing you as well. Now where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. And I know that there were people who were deceived by lies and misconceptions who came to the point where they felt like they just had to have an abortion. I understand that to some degree. But you know the Lord didn't lose those babies. Now, Kathy and I sort of disagree on this, but I think any, un, uh, any aborted child goes to be with the Lord. I don't think he loses those babies. I don't think he, he may make them immediately older, but I'm convinced that they, they go be with him. But for the person who has had the abortion, Jesus is reaching out in love. Jesus is reaching out in forgiveness. And Jesus will forgive the tragic sin of abortion if the person who's had it will call out to him 
and ask his forgiveness and receive his forgiveness by faith and with his help forgive herself. There are also people in abortion clinics who have been reached by Jesus who have revealed to them you're killing babies, stop it. And they have. And they too have been forgiven. And both these people who have provided, provided abortions and who have repented and received Jesus and the mothers who have had abortions they can be forgiven. Some of them are being forgiven. And now there are testimonies that abortion is wrong. Abortion is sinful. But there is forgiveness in the Lord for those who will turn to Him. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so if you know of somebody who's had an abortion and who feels bad about it, you might encourage them. Yes, there is forgiveness in Jesus. Jesus is that loving. Jesus is that compassionate. And Jesus wants to heal hurts as well as forgive sins. He wants to deliver from the bondages which have continued on into the present. He does that because he's the gracious Savior and Lord. Now, does anybody have a, something you would like to ask? And if I can't answer it, I'll ask Kathy to answer it. <laughs> don't be bashful. I don't know that I can answer it. You can ask it. <laughs> what you're saying about me be careful well I have made an impression and when Max died there is a, one of the PAs I was trying to think who I spoke to oh it was Carolyn I spoke to her about the PA because she, was, she talks about karma and all that stuff and I said it's not karma things that happen now is, the, is uh, what God has said is going to happen it's not karma. And so Carolyn gave me some material to take to her. And so I did. She said, I'm going to read part of this, but I'm not going to read all of it. But when Max died, she signed my card. She signed the card that they gave me. You'll get through this because you are so you're, you have lots of faith. And I said, yes. <laughs> she knows it. Well, um, I didn't even realize I did this. But when I go in, and I don't know that I still do it, but I say, just... Just out of the clear blue, uh, Jesus helped me get through this day. So somebody asked me one day, said, why do you say that? And I said, I wasn't even aware that I did. <laughs> but they make fun of me. But uh, anyway, today, Dr. Spitz was one of the doctors, and he's Jewish. And he came up there, and he told me, he said, Debbie, he said, I'm real sad that you're leaving, but said, I'm moving to New York. I said, oh, you're returning to? No, in six years. But I want you to visit me. But he said, there's one thing you're not going to like. And he said, I said, what's that? And he said, all the cursing. I said, I'm not coming to New York then. <laughs> that they know and they respect me even though they make fun of me. They, I've made an impression on some people there and that's what God put me there for. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's all. Anybody feel they had to close? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so good. Yes. It's good to get together and, and just share stories of how good and uh, what you've done in people's lives. We thank you for changing us. Because God, without you, we would be destined for an e e eternal damnation apart from you. But because of the work and ministry of Jesus Christ, we have the promise of eternal life. But God, that's not news just for us. That's news for, for the entire globe. And God, you've saved us. You've blessed us so that we can, in turn, bless others. We heard the good news because someone thought enough of us. So God, help us think enough of others. Let us be on the same mission that Jesus came for, that, that he should seek and save the lost and that none should be left behind. God, that should be the desire of our heart. So Father, well that up inside us that we would, we would seek nothing more than to be salt and light to this earth. That we would do just as Debbie said, uh, 
that we would so fall deeply in love with you and draw so close to you that we would, even, even without thinking about it, just say, Jesus, help me make it through the day because you are the only way we can make it. Because if we didn't keep, if we took our eyes off you, we would do just like Peter and sink in the, sink in the raging sea. Because to, truthfully, there's storms raging around us each and every single day. In a world that's becoming more and more hostile. But God, you've built your church to be solid. Solid, built on the rock. And we thank you for that. God, we lift up Debbie to you. And the decisions that she's making for retirement. God, I pray that you would lead her and guide her in the decisions that she makes. And, and God, help her just to be satisfied in you. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for everyone's testimony. God, we thank you for uh, just everything that you do for us. Let us in turn turn that outwards and bless others. God, we love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Charles is going to be doing pictures and autographs. Um, He's doing the book signing. Yeah. yeah. They're going for about five bucks on eBay right now. <laughs>